yo me puse a aparcar coche y me, me mantengo con eso, me mantengo de, de mi gasto, empiezo guardando dinero y... So I don't know about you, but clips like that and shows about extreme makeovers, I find myself unbelievably addicted to. I love watching clips like that one where you see someone go from being one thing to almost unrecognizable. Uh, in the city where I went to college, at Waco in Texas, uh, there's a little show that came up a few years ago called Fixer Upper. Uh, and I can already tell that everybody loves Fixer Upper. Everybody loves Fixer Upper. Uh, and the, the whole idea behind Fixer Upper, as most of you probably know, is that they will find a less than desirable home in the Waco area. They'll buy it uh, and they will fix it up. They'll make it look fantastic and do a whole host of different things to make this look like a completely different place. Uh, and people love it. And in fact, in Waco, this show is so universally loved that it's become kind of a tourist attraction. They have entire markets uh, and areas of the city dedicated to Magnolia and Fixer Upper because people love the idea of what this show is about so much. And there's a reason why we love shows like Fixer Upper and we like clips like that is because we like the idea of a makeover, don't we? We love the idea of something becoming brand new taking something that's broken and making it brand new. But my question for you this morning is, is this what Christianity is? Is the message of Jesus, is Christianity simply a message about a makeover? Is what Jesus has done for us simply about making us look a little tidier, putting us back together a little bit? Is it about a better us or a new us? That's the question that Paul is going to look at in Ephesians today. He's going to start talking about the Christian life, about what it means to live in everything that God has done for us. Because we are about to turn a corner in the letter to the Ephesians. As we've been going through this, Paul has been unloading on us incredible analogies and stories and pictures about everything that God has done for us in Jesus, in his son. He's told us about how God has achieved for us what we could never have achieved for ourselves, that nothing that God has done has come as a result of what we have done. And that's super important to remember as we now go into this discussion about what it means to live as a Christian and live in light of what God has done. And Paul intentionally spent all three chapters talking about this. He made sure that he talked about it again and again and again for a reason, because it is essential to then understanding what happens next, what comes next. And I want you to remember that. I want you to hold on to everything that's happened in Ephesians thus far in chapters one through three, this message that it is by grace alone and not by our works that God has done what he has done for us. But would you go ahead and read with me now as we start finding out about something called the new self, we're in Ephesians 4, verses 17 through 24. This is what God's word says. Now this I say and testify in the Lord, that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do <clears throat> in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality greedy to practice every kind of impurity, but that is not the way that you learned Christ. Assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus, to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self, 
created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. So Paul begins this section of his letter to the church in Ephesus by drawing a line between two different things, between an old self and a new self. And he's going to rule out what this new self is and how we are to walk in it. And the way he puts it is to put this new self on, almost as if we were putting on some clothes, to put it on and walk in it. The first thing we need to see is what it is. We need to understand what the new self is. The new self is a totally new identity that God has created for us. And it's created after the likeness of God, is what Paul tells us, in the image of God. And it is a completely new way to think about, to relate to, and to live in this world. It's the product of everything that we've been reading about, everything that Jesus has done, every step of his life, the sacrifice, his resurrection, everything was leading to something new that God has given us, and this is what it is, this new self, this new identity. If you are anything like me, when you visit your parents' home uh, and you get to go back, you have these moments of nostalgia where you want to kind of look back through things that they've held on to for you. Uh, and because I'm young enough, whenever I visit my mom in England, she still even has everything laid out the way it was when I was 16. Uh, and so I, I like to go back and dig through all of this ridiculous things that I used to do, and, and especially the way I used to dress. Now, when I was in high school in England, I got into like a, a skater boy phase. Now, a skater boy, if you don't know what that means, is I like to dress in hoodies and spike my hair when I still had hair. Uh, and I like to pretend that I was good on a skateboard. I wasn't, but there's no harm in pretending. Uh, and so I used to dress this way all the time. Now, on a trip back to England one time, I was going through some of the things that my uh, mom had kept, uh, and my mom is always telling me to throw it out because it's ridiculous, and I found a kind of a bunch of clothes from when I was in this ridiculous phase of my life, and I, just th I thought it would be funny to go ahead and dress up as I used to when I was 16, to put on my clothes from when I was 16 years old, uh, and uh, <laughs> you can probably already imagine how silly this ended up looking. First of all, I looked like I was dressed in my toddler's clothes. Uh, it didn't fit me at all. It just looked very silly. But even more ridiculous than that is when I dressed like this, one of the kind of fads of the day was to wear a chain on your uh, trousers. Uh, and normally there was the actual chains made for this that people would wear. But because I was a moron, I went and bought a dog leash and I cut the start of the dog leash off and the end of it off, and then I just clipped it to my jeans. So I, when I dress up like this, I realize all of a sudden I'm wearing a huge dog leash attached to my jeans. It didn't look pretty, and it didn't look smart either. And I can tell you, no skater boy would have ever wanted to hang out with me. Now, the reason I tell you this story is that when I went back to dress how I used to dress, when I went and put on the clothes that I used to dress myself in, it looked ridiculous. It didn't fit who I am. It wasn't who I was. When I came back to what I used to be, it didn't fit with me. It wasn't simply that it didn't fit me size-wise. It didn't fit who I was. When I looked in the mirror and I saw that, I knew that isn't who I was anymore. And that's what the new self is. The new self that God has created for you and created for me and given to us in his son is a radically new identity it changes the very fundamentals of who you are. This is what Paul says. He says in verse 24, put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Who you are now as a result of what Jesus has done does not fit with who you were. They are two completely irreconcilable things. You can't meet Jesus and then be who you were before that moment. The way the Bible puts it is that you are a new creation, a completely new creature, that it isn't simply that you've had a makeover and had a few things that's tidied you up. It's not a list of new behaviors and perspectives and ways to think. It is a completely new you. Who you were doesn't fit you anymore because it's gone. To try and be who you were before meeting Jesus is to be as ridiculous as it is when I go home and put on those clothes that don't fit me anymore. 
This is another way that Paul says this idea and explains this idea of new self. In his letter to the Colossians, he says, Don't lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge after the image of its creator. There's that same language about creation. Not change, creation. This is something brand new. It's like a caterpillar to a butterfly. Totally different. If you remember a couple of weeks ago, we were talking about the church and about what the church is, and Paul talked in Ephesians 2 that there is no longer Gentile or Jew. There is a new people. There is something that has never been seen before. It's not one or the other. It's not a change from one to the other. It's brand new. It's that same idea. This new self is what Paul was talking about when he was talking about Jews and Gentiles. A completely new thing that had never existed prior to this moment. Is that how you think about your Christian identity? Or do you think about it as kind of a makeover? That what Jesus has done on the cross for you has tidied you up. It's, it's changed the hairstyle. It's changed the clothes. It's changed your views on certain things. But deep down, are you still the same? Because my encouragement to you and my, my urgency to you is that you are not the same. If you have come to know Jesus, you are a new creation. Who you wear is gone. The Bible goes as far as to say even that it's been crucified with Christ. Who you wear is in a grave. You are a new creation. Something brand new. But Paul says this really interesting thing that can confuse us a little bit. He says that we have to put this on. So what does he mean to put on this new ident identity? To put on this new you? Well, he starts by saying that we have to renew our mind. We have to have a new mind because we are a new creature. We are not who we were, so we can't think and have the same mind as what we were. When I worked in a university here in the area, one of the things that I had to do is talk with students about their kind of track through college to help them navigate it. And one of the things that we as advisors always were taught about is the research of someone called Carol Dweck. Now, Carol Dweck is a researcher who studied mindsets in students as they go through the education system. And succinctly, this is what she discovered when she did her research. She found that there was two different types of mindsets, generally, in students who went through college. The first is something that she called a fixed mindset. And what she said about this fixed mindset is that it was the mind of students who decided that their ability in school was decided by their birth. That they are either good at math or they are not good at math. That there's nothing they can do about that. That's who they were made and it can't change. That's why it's called fixed. And this is one interesting thing that she said about that group of students. She said that believing that your qualities are carved in stone, the fixed mindset, creates an urgency to prove yourself over and over. It creates an urgency to prove yourself over and over. Does that sound similar to anything to you? Because to me, it sounds like a lot of the ways that we relate to God. We feel that we need to prove ourselves to him over and over. And sometimes we do that because we believe the sins and the flaws and the mistakes in our life are etched into our DNA, that there's nothing that we can do about it, that we are who we are, and we are just going to have to try and prove to God that there is something redeemable about us. That maybe if we just work hard enough, if we prove to him, then all of this imbalance in the scales, all of these sins, all of these mistakes can somehow be outweighed by whatever we do contribute. Well, the first piece of bad news I have for you is there's nothing that you will ever do that will contribute enough to balance out those scales. But there is something that Jesus has done that means you don't have to prove yourself over and over. And putting on this new mind means understanding what that is. There are two mindsets in Christianity. There is the old mind and there is the new mind. The old mind is what Paul describes at the beginning of this passage. It doesn't sound very pretty. The way he describes this old Gentile mindset is he says that it's futile, it's ignorant, it's darkened, it's deceived. Some pretty uncomfortable words to describe this mindset. 
But what Paul wants them to understand, what he wants the church in Ephesus to grasp, is that they need a new way to think because their old mindset is gone, been taken away by what Jesus has done. He has created a new way to think, a new way to understand who God is. Because what we think will affect the way that we live. What you think will inevitably work its way out in what you do with your life. Paul says it another way to the church in Rome. He says, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. There's a Christian author called A.W. Tozer who's very famous for talking about the way that we think about God. And he has this one quote that gets quoted quite a bit. It says, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. We tend by a secret law of the soul to move towards our mental image of God. This is not true only of the individual Christian, but of the company of Christians that composes the church. Always the most revealing thing about the church is her idea about God. The most revealing thing about the church The most important thing that we think about as Christians is our idea of God. What's your idea of God? What fills your mind when you think about the God that we read about on Sunday mornings? Because the Gentile mindset, the old mind, is prone to say things like he is careless, he is distant, removed, cold, he's angry, he's vengeful, He's self-absorbed. This is the way many atheists talk about God. But the problem I have with that, when they talk that way, when they think about God this way, is that it does not fit with the God that I read about in my Bible. It doesn't fit. Think about what we heard about in Ephesians 1 through 3. Think about what God revealed about himself in those chapters through Paul. A God that adopts us, that fights for us, that sacrifices his life for us, that blesses us with every spiritual blessing, that before the foundations of the world, he chose us in him. Doesn't fit with angry or vengeful or distant or cold. Does not fit. The old mind does not fit with the new life that God has given you. See, the answer to how you renew your mind, how you can renew your mind and walk in this new mind is to immerse yourself in God's word. To get into this book and ask yourself what it says about who God is and let the truth of God's word erode away all of your negative and incorrect thinking about who God is. You need to renew your mind. You need to come to God's word and let it change the way that you think how you decide what's valuable, how you decide what is important. Put off the mindset that there is something that you must prove to God in order to earn affection. That's old mind thinking. Put off the mindset that says there is something in this world worth chasing other than God. That is the old mind. Put off the mindset The the new you can only be skin deep and temporary. That's the old mind. Renew your mind. Renew your mind by the power of God's word. Put on the mindset that the God of the universe cares for you. That the God of the universe fights for you, adopts you, gives himself for you, and is near to you in your time of need. Put on the mindset that knows that knows without a shadow of a doubt that God has already loved you in his son before there was anything that you could ever do for him. That is the new mind. The mindset that acknowledges the truth of God's word. The mind that acknowledges the real reality that Christ bought for us on the cross with his own body and with his own blood. Start thinking like you are living a brand new life because you are. When God creates a new self for you, he creates a new life. 
a life that is lived differently, a life that's lived purposefully, and a life that says no to the things of this world and yes to the things of God. That's what a new life is. As many of you guys know, I have two boys, the older of which is now three, and so we are completely into the phase of trying to prevent him from burning the world down. Uh, we're trying to discipline him and teach him what's right and what's wrong. Uh, now, I tell many people, I'm not as good at this as my wife, because if he turns on the waterworks, I, he, I'm his prisoner. I'll do anything he wants. But if I am a loving father, I need to learn how to be able to say no to him, how to be able to teach him and guide him and discipline him. For example, if my son was in the middle of the street, uh, he was out there, and a car was coming towards him, what kind of father would I be if I didn't say anything about that? If there was dangers and destructive things in this world and I didn't teach my son that he needed to say no to them. If I sat back on my garden and watched as something terrible was coming towards my son and just kind of, you know, do what you want. Don't worry about it. No, a loving father, a real loving father would say, get out of the road, there is a car coming. Don't stay where there is destructive things headed towards you. That's what is about to happen in this passage, is we are about to see the love of God unfold for us in how he tells us about this new life. In Ephesians 4, 25 through 32, this is what Paul writes. He says, therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands, so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up, as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption." Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another as Christ in God forgave you. Now let's be clear before we unpack this. What this is absolutely not is a list of how to be a good person. What we have just read has absolutely nothing to do with you being a good person. What Jesus has done for us has nothing to do with us being good people. It is about right relationship with God and other people. And people may categorize that as being a good person, but we need to understand that it, it goes so much deeper than that, that that's not what this is about. If that's what you reduce this to, you will miss the point of the new life. Because the new life is about right and perfect relationship with God and with the people around you. Paul essentially gives us five patterns of living in this little passage. And each one of those five things has these two unique things about them. First of all, everything that he says concerns relationships. It concerns how we relate to God and how we relate to the people around us. And the second thing is that every single one of these, even as it prohibits something and says no to something, it equally says yes to something else. Let me read some of them back to you and listen for those two things. Listen for how they relate to relationships and how they say no and yes at the same time. Put away falsehood, tell the truth in verse 25. Don't sin in your anger, but be angry when the situation calls for it. When 26 and 27 says, be angry and do not sin. Don't steal, work, and be generous in verse 28. Don't use your words for evil. Use them for building up in verse 29. Don't be unkind or bitter. Be kind and loving in 31 through 32. Every one of those concerns relationships. Every single one. And every single one of them is not simply restricting something. It's guiding you and giving you a principle for something better. 
And those two things are present in every command that God has ever given us from day one in the garden through until now. When God says no to something, it is because he wants to protect our joy. It's because he wants to protect this new and good life that he has given to us. All of God's commands, every single one, are about right relationship vertically with God or horizontally with people. And they are about giving us something better than we could create for ourselves out of our own desires. You see, there are ways to live as a Christian after having been saved that violates the new identity that God has given you. Your new identity is a result of what Jesus has done, his beloved children. That's how God sees you. That's how God thinks about you. Beloved children. And there are ways that you can then walk in your life that violates that identity, that doesn't reflect what has been done for you. Things that are destructive to your relationship with God and things that are destructive to your relationship with people. I don't think any one of us reading this list thinks that lying is profitable, that it's a great idea, that it's going to feel good when it happens. Even though we struggle with that, we know that it's bad for relationships. Putting on the new self and walking in the new life is about enjoying the gift of right relationship that God has given us, not only with himself, but with people around us. Remember, Ephesians tells us just as much about the new relationships and the reconciliation that God has given us with people around us as he did with himself. So let me help you understand something, and I hope you take this away from this. When God lays out guidelines like this in Scripture, it is not about him withholding something from us. It's about him protecting something. When God says no to something, it is not about him withholding something. It is about him protecting something good for us. Because he's a loving father. Because he can't stand by and let things continue that are destructive to us and our relationships with people. God has made you new and he wants to protect that. He desperately wants to protect that because he loves you. You see, the new self, all of this, the new mind, the new self, the new life, is really all about love. It's about a new love that God has given us. It is about a love that we have received and a love that we then get to imitate to the world. And it is that love that is the engine of putting on the new self. It's that love which is the power that you need in order to be able to put this new self on. When I first became a Christian, I really struggled to live in this new self, to be the person that I knew God intended for me. What I mean by that is that I would constantly still go back to the same old sins and mistakes and flaws that I'd always been living in. My life didn't change. It didn't look any different after coming to know the Lord. And that really burdened me. It bothered me because I knew that I was supposed to look different. In that time, I was being mentored by a guy who was actually the guy who had told me about Jesus, told me about the Bible. And every time I would go to him and I'd tell him, you know, I've, I've made a mistake here. I've, I've done this or I've done that. And, and this was the guy who was challenging me and pushing me to, to be better and do better, to change the way that I was living. And every time I would go back to him and I would have to tell him I failed, I didn't do it, I messed up. And I hated having to have those conversations because I felt like a failure. I felt like I couldn't be a Christian And if I couldn't be a Christian, then how could God love someone like me? I kept letting my selfishness guide my decisions. I kept putting me ahead of everything else, and it only brought me pain. But my mentor did something that I didn't expect. Every time I had one of these conversations with him, every time I had to go in and tell him how I failed and stank at being a Christian, My mentor told me he loved me. 
told me he's going to be with me, that he's going to pray with me, that he's going to help me and support me. And I didn't quite notice that at first. It was just kind of a part of the process. But after a while, when I realized how relentless his grace for me was, I started to see something else. I started to see the love of Jesus in my mentor. That man became Christ to me and showed me what this love that we talk about, that we think about, really is. It is a love that is compelled to love you even when you are a failure, even when you struggle. He loved me when I was a failure, and he was imitating Christ to me. He was showing me who God was because he loved me at my worst. And it was that love, taking notice of that love, that then gave me the power to become something different, to become something new, to put on the new self. Paul says in Ephesians 5, 1 and 2, right after this passage, Therefore be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and a sacrifice to God. Listen, Paul wants you to understand one thing in this entire passage. He wants you to understand that putting on the new self must always, always, always start with the love that God has given you. It must start with that. It cannot be about you trying to give yourself a makeover and become something different. The new self and putting it on starts with seeing the love that God has for you. Professor at Calvin College, James K. Smith, says, It's your loves that govern your actions and pursuits. Indeed, you are more defined by what you love than what you think, nor even believe. Putting on the new self is not about a makeover. It is about love. It is about the love that God has for you. It's about you accepting and walking in the love that has already been given and promised to you as a result of what Jesus has done. Ephesians 4 is given to us because of Ephesians 1 through 3. So church... Brothers and sisters in Christ, my call to you this morning is to put on the new self. To walk in the identity that God has created for you in his likeness. To renew your mind by the truth of God's word. Put yourself in this book, read these words, and let your new mind be created by the truth of who God is and what he's done. Put on the new life and walk in the love that Christ showed you that Christ gave to you when you were at your worst. Be imitators of God, not because you have to be, but because that is the gift that God has given you. Would you guys pray with me this morning as we close? Father, I thank you for the new self. I thank you for the new life that you purchased, that you created, and that you gave to me. Thank you that what you do for me and for us here this morning is not simply give us a makeover, tidy us up and make us look different, but Father, you create a new identity, a radical new identity that we get to walk in. Lord, give us grace to see your love that we might walk in it, that we might put it on and imitate you to this world. It's in Christ's name that we pray, amen. As we close this morning, I want to remind you that uh, this weekend we have our benevolent offering that you can give to at the back. It's just an occasion for us as a church to give to those in need. Uh, and as always, if there is anything that we can be praying for you, if there's any way we can support you, don't hesitate to let one of us know. But let me offer this morning's benediction. Would you pray this with me? That as we go, we would go in the name of the God who has created a new identity for us that by his grace we would put on the new self and walk in his love, that we might imitate him to a world that desperately needs him. It's in the name of Jesus that we go. Amen.